All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Council Member Rafael Salamanca, Chair of the Subcommittee on Planning, Dispositions, and Concessions. Welcome to today's hearing. Uh, today we are joined by Council Member Andy Cohen. Uh, we are going to be hearing LU-797, the Archer Green Tax Exemption, HPD seeks approval of the Article 11 tax exemption pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law for a term of 40 years. Archer Green Apartments Housing Development Fund Corporation, HDFC, will acquire the property and Archer Green Apartments LP, a limited partnership, will be the owner and operator of the property. Collectively, these two organizations will acquire the property at 92-33, 168th Street in Queens and construct the building with loans from New York City, HDC, and HPD, as well as low-income housing tax credits. The approval will facilitate a mixed building, a mixed use building with a residential tower above a base with commercial and community facility uses. The residential tower is expected to include 387 units. This site is in Council Member Miller's district. I am now opening up the public hearing on LU 797. Mr. Speaker, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jordan Press. I'm Executive Director for Planning and Development in HPD's Government Affairs Unit. Um, I'm joined, if we do need questions, uh, by both the sponsor of the project as well as uh, HPD development staff. Land use uh, number 797 consists of an exemption area located at 92-33, 168th Street in Queens Council District 27. Now known as Archer Green, the site is comprised of an underutilized two-story parking garage that is partially occupied by the New York Police Department. The project area was awarded to the sponsor in 2016 as part of a request for proposals issued in 2015 by the New York City Economic Development Corporation, EDC. Redevelopment of the site entails the construction of two residential buildings ab above a commercial and community facility base. Disposition of the site is being handled by EDC and the sponsor is developing the site through HPD's mix and match program. Currently, the plan is to construct one 19-story building and one 23-story building that will total 387 units of 100% affordable rental housing with a mixture of unit types, including 38 studios, 161 bedrooms, 164 two-bedrooms, and 24 three-bedrooms, plus a superintendent's unit. Under the mix and match program, household income targets range from 40% to 130% of AMI for a family of three with rents uh, ranging from 37% AMI to 100% AMI. The building will be constructed to meet Enterprise Green Community Certification. As the committee... Could you repeat the last one? What was the 40% and then 37%? Yeah, so the income targets, the income that the residents earn is from 40 to 130 but the rents are set at 40 to 100, meaning that the highest income, yes. Meaning that the, um, for, the, for the higher income tiers, uh, the, the rent will be set at the lower part of that tier, but the incomes can range from, in the case of the top tier, from 100% AMI up to 130% of AMI, even though the rent is at 100. The building will be constructed to meet Enterprise Green Community Certification. As the committee is aware, our term sheets require a set aside of units for formerly homeless households through our Our Space program. We're continuing to have co conversations with the council member about the inclusion of these units. The commercial space will be comprised of 69,000 square feet and community facility space will be comprised of 16,000 square feet. Commercial businesses anticipated for the site include a grocery store uh, slash supermarket. The community facility space is expected to be occupied by an adult daycare or domestic violence center. Additionally, uh, amenities include roughly 206 underground parking spaces. Of those 206 spaces, 60 will be reserved for NYPD, 77 reserved for tenants, and 69 commercial spaces. Other amenities planned for the project is a community room with shared kitchen facilities and roof terrace. In order to facilitate long-term affordability of the rental units, HPD is before the planning subcommittee seeking Article 11 tax benefits. Um, the commercial and community facility spaces are excluded from the exemption area. Finally, I'd like to add that it is our hope to close on this project utilizing bond financing in December, which makes the timely passage of this request all the more important. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Press. We've been joined by uh, Council Member Danique Miller and Council Member uh, Darlene Mealy. Um, so I am going to refer to you, uh, Council Member Miller. You have any questions on your project? Uh, but let me just start by saying this is a project that obviously is, is, is an RFP that was out in 2008 and kind of found its life uh, about three years back and certainly was were not without its challenges. Um, myself and, and, and my colleagues in, in state government and, and community board and other community stakeholders have, have really uh, invested a lot as well as the developer and I think that we've gotten to the point that we reckon that, that this project will reflect the values and the needs of the community. Um, we had certainly, we had some concerns about the AMIs and I, and I think that we've worked through those and continue to do so. And then the last caveat of the, the homeless population uh, is something that we are willing to address as well. Um, and I'm, I'm and, and, and I know it's going to be, we're going to be, this is going to be held over for a few and, and allow us to kind of work through those last kinks, but it's certainly that this is a project that needs to get up and running uh, sooner than later. And, and uh, everybody involved seems to be um, willing to do the work that, that will get us there. So appreciate your support, all the support that the committee is, and land use has given and look forward to continuing to work with developing HPD on this project. But I'm here to make sure that it all goes well. We're sure that we, we absolutely have a, we all have a lot invested, so we want to make sure it gets right. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Cohen has some questions. I just want to understand the rent for my own. Uh, so the rent is fixed at 100% of AMI on certain units, but I could earn up to 130%? You would be, you would qualify for it if you earned between 100 and 130% of AMI. But the, the rent is fixed at a the fixed is rent, the rent is fixed calculated at, off of at, at 100% of AMI. And the reason that we do that on the highest income tier is to create uh, a bigger pool of potential candidates with the concern uh, usually coming from the financial institutions that possibly those highest income uh, renters might be more difficult to locate. Well, if, I, if I make, in, in this example, and again, I, I have great confidence in Council Member Miller and I, I'm just sort of educating myself in terms of the, if I make 45%, if my income is 45% of AMI, do I end up in a unit that's based on 37% or based on 57%? Or can, am I eligible for the project? Can I live in the project? You are eligible. Give me one second. I, I, I need to check on the exact way that the marketing bands versus AM, uh, income tiers work, and I will get back to all members. In of light of the fact that this item is being laid over, the next uh, Absol that would be very helpful. Well before then. Thank you. That's it, Mr. Chair. Uh, a few questions on this project. Um, is there going to be a community preference? Yes. Yeah, and that's a 50%? The typical 50% community preference. All right. And the homeless set aside, how many units was HPD, uh, you know, how many units were you, you, right. you were trying to implement so, in this project? So this project was negotiated well before uh, any, um, any term sheet changes uh, took place and before the 10% requirement took place. And we want to be respectful of the fact that the councilman and the community and the developer went through very long and difficult negotiations to make this a project that works for everyone. Um, again, our term sheets require 10%, um, but we, we need to have continuing conversations with the councilmen and the community to make sure that um, we're, we're doing the right thing by everyone. Uh, in terms of local hiring, can you explain that process, how that's gonna work? I'm gonna have to ask the developer to join us for that, if you could. Come right in.
If you can just uh, please state your name and the uh, your name of your company. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Gene Schnur from Omni, New York. Uh, the, the local hiring, I, I, don't, I don't have the breakdown in front of me, but we have a very extensive local hiring preference, uh, both, uh, you know, obviously the city, Queens, and we've even narrowed down to the zip code uh, here. And, you know, we've spent uh, extensive time with Council Member Miller uh, making sure that the local hiring is you know reflective and what is needed in the community. I honestly I don't have it. We put it in our RFP and then we negotiate afterwards and we signed an agreement with the council member and the local stakeholders. So there is a very extensive local hiring, including getting down narrowing down to the uh, to the zip code. And so you're going to be working hand in hand with the council member's office and the local community board um, to ensure this local hiring. Is there going to be a reporting mechanism back? Uh, to both the council member and the local community yes, board? Uh, we, we hired, uh, I guess, an advisor or consultant in the process okay. here, uh, Crescent. Yes. Uh, and they're, they're, that's one of their responsibilities. All right. Um, and then my, uh, my last two questions is, so I guess working with Crescent, I know them well. They're also going to ensure that you're complying with the MWBEs in terms of Correct. ensuring that women and minority business owners are getting these local contractors. Correct. That's part of their scope of work that, they're, that they right. have to follow through with us. And then finally, if you can just explain to me your plan on ensuring that residents in that community actually have access to those units. Are you going to have any housing forums where you, know, you, you will help individuals in the community apply online? Um, any, any forums where individuals that have any credit issues they can go and seek some type of financial help. So when that development is, is completed, they, uh, they're they prepared to apply and then hopefully be approved? Yes, I mean, and also we've discussed this with Crescent about them being kind of the community outreach and we may work also obviously with the council member's office. Uh, I, I mean, look, there's gonna be, there's obviously there's local, uh, you know, there's preferences and community preferences, but you know, most of these units are gonna end up in a lottery uh, in, in the lottery system here, and I'm sure there's going to be, you know, th tens of thousands of applicants for it, but we will work with local tenants to make sure that, you know, they're part of the lottery, they know when to sign up for the lottery so that we get a, you know, a lot of representative from the local community. All right, thank you. Uh, just, yes, go ahead, Council Member. So on, on that issue, we, we do have part of our agreement in Malibu as well, is that there are forums around, um, uh, financial literacy and, 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 and credit uh, for the, so that we have to make sure that our 50% of our applicants are qualified uh, so that we meet the number of our, our set aside, 50% set aside as well as the, uh, so, so we're satisfied with that, that, that we're, we're sending qualified applicants that we can meet that number as well as the MWBE that uh, the group particip participated yesterday in a um, MWBE uh, contractors forum as well. So aside from the local highs, local contractors as well, and, 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 and we've met with Crescent, and so we're confident now, but I'm sure <coughs> that, that with the council's oversight, that all of this will, 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 will happen. But uh, those are great questions, and, and those things are in place. All right, thank you. All right, so with that, are there any more members of the public who wish to testify? Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member. Uh, I wanna, I was gonna recognize, uh, please recognize Mr. Uh, Council Member Mark Traeger. You, ha you have any questions, Council Member? All right, uh, so are there any more members of the public who wish to testify? <coughs> All right, seeing none, I will now close public hearings LU-796. Thank you. All right, so I'm sorry. Now we're actually closing LU-797. Uh, so now next we're, uh, we're opening up the public session on LU-796, the Angelou Court tax exemption. 
HPD is seeking approval of an Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 40 years pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law. The property consists of an existing five-story building and contains 23 occupied rental units in Councilmember Perkins' district. The building's ownership will transition from Angelus Associates LP to Angelus Court Association Housing Development Fund Corporation, the HDFC. The HDFC is expected to obtain approval of a corporation offering plan and current residents will be offered the opportunity to purchase shares of the HDFC. The HDFC will also finance a rehabilitation with loans from HPD and HDC. Um, I would also like to recognize Councilmember Donis Rodriguez who has joined us. Uh, so now I am opening up public hearings LU 796, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Once again, my name is Jordan Press from HPD. Land use number 796 consists of an exemption area located at 516 to 520 Manhattan Avenue in Manhattan in, Manhattan in Council District 9 and is known as Angelou Court. On July 15, 1997, the City Council approved Angelou Court as a low-income residential project under the New York State Housing Trust Fund program. The buildings were conveyed to the sponsor, a partnership between Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement, or HCCI, and Boston Capital, and financing for the project included low-income housing tax credits. The land disposition agreement and housing trust fund regulatory agreement that was executed in 1998 explicitly requires that the project be operated as a limited equity co-op at the, at the end of the tax credit period. Therefore, under HPD's Year 15 Preservation Program, the project will undergo a repositioning of the ownership structure as well as a rehabilitation and conversion from a rental to a limited equity co-op, provided that the residents meet the standard thresholds for becoming a cooperative. We understand that there's strong support among the residents to move forward with this conversion. In total, there are 23 existing units with a mix of one, two, and three bedroom apartments and the targeted um, household income AMIs at resale until 2029 are at 60% of AMI. We expect maintenance will range, uh, will be about 40% AMI ranging from 787 for a one bedroom to 1,091 for a three bedroom. Rehabilitation will include asbestos remediation, facade repair, roof and window replacement, boiler system replacement, trash, trash compactor replacement, installation of energy efficient lighting in common areas and apartments, and installation of energy efficient plumbing fixtures. In order to help preserve affordability of the, of the units, HPD is before the planning subcommittee seeking full Article 11 tax benefits that will coincide with a 40 year regulatory agreement. Council Member Perkins has been briefed and is supportive of moving the project forward. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Press. Are there any questions on this project from um, council members? No? Are there any more members of the public who wish to testify? All right, seeing none, I will now close public hearings LU-796. We will now move to a vote on one item, the Angelou Court Tax Exemption, which has the support of Council Member Perkins. All the other, I'm sorry. I will now call on a vote for LU-796, the Angelou Court exem Exemption. Council, please call the vote. Salamanca. Aye. Mealy. Aye. Cohen. Aye. Traeger. Aye. By a vote of four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, with zero abstentions. Rodriguez. Oh, you're still here. <laughs> Rodriguez. Aye. By a vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, with zero abstentions, the item is recommended for approval and referred to the full land use committee. All right. Thank you. Uh, so now we will uh, move to LU 792 through 795, the Edwin Place applications. Our applications by HPD for zoning map change from R6 to R7-2 slash C2 uh, to C3, a zoning tax amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area, a zoning special permit to allow community facility floor area to apply to nonprofit supportive housing and an urban development action area project, UDAP designation. Project approval and disposition approval for city owned property at three Livonia Avenue in Brooklyn. These actions will facilitate the development of a new eight-story building with 125 supportive and affordable housing units and ground floor retail or community facility space. The project is in Council Member Mealy's district. 
I am now opening up the public hearings on LU 792 through 795 Edwin's Place. And Councilmember Mealy, would you like to, Councilmember, would you like to make an opening statement? Oh, um, thank you, Chairman. I just want to say um, I have talked to this development numerous, well, a couple of times, and I asked them to change from a uh, majority of studio apartments into at least um, two and three bedroom apartments. Everyone um, does, does have children. A lot of people have children, a lot of people does not. But I prefer to make sure that families who live in the neighborhood could afford and stay in the neighborhood. And the studio apartments are great, but we try, uh, East New York and um, Brownsville, we put a moratorium on studios. We are asking for much more than just studios. And they came back twice with the same exact thing, and that's why I was against this project. So I would love to hear what they're saying. Mr. Bryan said they would take it off the um, calendar, and they were here next year, but it's here today, so I'm willing to listen. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Members. Uh, if you, uh, the speakers, if you can please introduce yourselves. So I'll begin the testimony and then turn it over to the development team. Land use numbers 792 through 795 are related ULARP actions regarding a project known as Edmunds Place, located at 3 Livonia Place in Brooklyn Council District 41. Land use number 792 consists of a zoning map amendment that will change an R6 district to an R72 district to increase the maximum allowable floor area ratio from 4.8 to 6.5. As planned, the proposed development will reach a total FAR of 4.94. Also, a zoning map amendment will map a C23 commercial overlay, which will expand retail opportunities along this portion of Livonia Avenue. Land use number 793 consists of an amendment to the zoning resolution in order to es establish a mandatory inclus inclusionary housing area. Land use number 794 seeks UDAP designation, project approval, and disposition of vacant city owned land that will be developed under HPD's supportive housing loan program. Land use number 795 consists of an application submitted seeking the grant of a special permit to modify the requirements of the maximum floor area ratio for certain community facility uses. The special permit will allow a nonprofit institution with sleeping accommodations in connection with the proposed development in an R72 C23 district. The development team for this project is Breaking Ground 2 HDFC, who will provide property management services and the African American Planning Commission who will provide on-site services. I'd like to begin with a brief history of the evolution of this project. Um, that, um, I'm sorry, <clears throat> the developer is gonna go uh, further into the history of this project, but I did wanna state that this current proposal before the council is a result of an iterative input and comments that we received from the community and from the borough president's office and which has continued before and throughout the ULERP process. The newly constructed building will be comprised of eight stories with a total of 125 rental units plus a superintendent's unit. Um, as, a as a result of the input that we received, the sponsor is proposing to include 56 studios, 34 one bedrooms, 26 two bedrooms, and nine three bedroom apartments. I'd like to note that many of our supportive housing developments include all or mostly studio apartments. In this case, however, HPD and the developer have responded to requests and so this project has a mix where 55% of the units are family size units. As is typical of our supportive housing developments, 60% of the units will be for formerly homeless individuals and families, while 40% of the units will be non-supportive units open to the community. Another anomaly from a typical supportive housing development of ours is that oftentimes the non-supportive units are all at 60% of AMI. In this development and in response to calls from the community, AMIs will range including 40%, 50%, and 60% of AMI units. The sponsor is also proposing to include the following green and sustainable features in the project. A green roof, solar panels, triple glazed windows, a super insulated building envelope, energy efficient systems and appliances and lighting, and water conservation features. There will be a 24 hour attended lobby, state of the art security camera system, a multi-purpose room for tenants and community events, landscape courtyard for resident use, and a fitness room with exercise equipment, a digital library, and on-site laundry room. 
Services that will be provided by the African American Planning Commission will include job readiness training, financial literacy, and money management classes, as well as substance abuse counseling, mental health services, and benefits assistance. The project also includes approximately 3,000 square feet of ground floor retail space. The ground floor retail space will support the city's efforts to activate the Livonia Avenue corridor, which is a, a goal identified in HPD's recently released Brownsville plan. At this time, um, the sponsor is continuing to work to identify a tenant for the space and has taken into account this, the, the suggestions that the council member has made regarding who that tenant might be. Again, the project has re received unanimous support from the community board, strong support from the borough president, and letters of support from other local elected officials and community stakeholders. So we're before the committee asking for your support. I'd like to turn it over now to the developer who has a presentation. Um, and is this my presentation? Sorry, can you just repeat your name again? The mic was not on. Yep. My name is David Beer from Breaking Ground. Um, um, just very briefly about Breaking Ground. Be Breaking Ground is a developer and operator of affordable and supportive housing. We operate about 3,500 units in Brooklyn, uh, Manhattan, the Bronx, Connecticut, and upstate New York. Breaking Ground has two previous uh, affordable and supportive housing projects in Community Board 16, the Dominich and the Hegeman. Um, our uh, local partner, East Brooklyn Congregations, um, uh, their support for those two projects was <coughs> instrumental in being able to move forward, and EBC also strongly supports this project. Next. This, is, this is, oops. This is uh, the, the site map. Um, the project is on Livonia Avenue between Grafton Street and Howard. Avenue. Um, it is about two blocks away from the Saratoga Avenue number three train stop. This is uh, a few photographs of the site. It's 20,000 square foot city owned vacant land and you can see the elevated number three train tracks uh, going along Livonia Avenue. Next. So as Jordan mentioned, Breaking Ground and African American Planning Commission will jointly develop the project. 47 units will be for low income community residents. A total of 78 units will be for homeless individuals and families. Uh, 53 of the 78 units will be studios and 25 will be family apartments. And again, Breaking Ground will be the property manager and African American Planning Commission will provide the on-site services. This is the uh, breakout of the uh, unit mix. Um, as you can see, most of the supportive units, or most of the studios, rather, are supportive units, and most of the uh, community affordable units are family units. In fact, over 50% of the community units are two and three bedroom apartments. This is um, a a breakdown of the 47 community units, which are a portion between three affordability tiers, 40% AMI, 50% AMI, and 60% AMI. So for an example, in the 40% AMI um, tier, a two-bedroom apartment will rent for $718 a month. A two-bedroom apartment in the 50% tier will rent for $933 a month and a two-bedroom apartment in the 60% AMI tier will rent for $1,148 a month. I'm sorry, just to go back. Uh, yes. This proposed residential program, this, these graphs that you're showing us, this is not for the support of housing, right? This is just for the affordable housing? Yes, this the is 48, just the 47. The 47 units? Yes. For the, uh, all 78 of the homeless units will have project-based Section 8 rental assistance. So, uh, breaking ground in African American. I'm sorry, sir. I'm yes. just, Council Member, you have questions? Um, 
78 units is project-based, Section 8? Correct. So if the city, because sometimes the city uh, stops Section 8 for a while, what would happen to these units? I would say that the city is committed to uh, providing all of these project-based Section 8. I can't think of a time, including during sequestration, where we had to effectively kill a project because we had to pull back on project-based Section 8. I suppose if the situation were <coughs> truly dire, we would find another source of rental assistance in order to keep the project uh, to be the same one that we've, we're presenting today. So with respect to the history of the project, uh, Breaking Ground and African American Planning Commission first met with uh, Community Board 16 in 2015, and at that time we were proposing 100% studios with no retail space. Um, in May of 2016, we met with the borough president staff. They made the suggestion of uh, creating the three uh, affordability tiers for the community units, which we incorporated into our plan. Then in the fall of 2016, uh, we went back to uh, the Community Board 16 and proposed a project that has the mix of studios and family units that uh, we we're presenting today. Uh, there is also a 3,000 square foot storefront, which uh, will be for either retail or accessory community facility use. Um, in January of this year, the Community Board 16 issued a letter to support the project. In June of this year, the Community Board 16 voted unanimously to support the project. The next, the following month, the borough president uh, gave uh, his recommendation to support the ULERP application. As I mentioned before, East Brooklyn Congregations is also a strong supporter of the project. We also have a letter of support for the project from State Senator Jesse Hamilton. At this time, I'd like to uh, um, ask uh, Matthew Okabi from the African American Planning Commission to uh, briefly um, talk about uh, his organization and the on-site services and amenities. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matthew Okabi. I am the um, executive director of African American Planning Commission. Uh, we are partnering with um, Breaking Ground to develop Edwin's Place, and AAPC's role would be to provide on-site services to both supportive um, to families and adults in the supportive housing units and to those who do not need supportive services. Um, African American Planning Commission was incorporated in 1996. We currently provide domestic violence um, services both in Brooklyn and in the Bronx. Uh, we develop um, and operate the largest transitional tier two shelters in, in Brooklyn and in the Bronx. We also provide services to um, homeless individuals with mental health issues, substance abuse issues, and things of that nature. Um, part of the services, um, as Mr. Beer mentioned, um, part of the services that African American Planning Commission is going to provide at this facility um, came about as a result of our meetings with the community board. Um, for example, we noticed that one of the um, concerns of the community board and the um, um, other elected officials was security in the neighborhood. And therefore, we're going to have um, in this particular facility 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, security cameras, and also lighting, because this particular neighborhood is kind of um, dark at this present time, and because of the overhead um, trains. There's gonna be an on-site multi-purpose room for the tenants, and community um, events can be held within the building. Um, part of our design that the community board um, desired was to have landscape courtyard, which we are presenting. Um, in addition to such a beautiful building, we are also gonna provide many amenities that we have seen in many Manhattan buildings, such as the fitness room and the exercise rooms, exercise machines, a library, an on-site uh, laundry room. Um, African American Planning Commission is particularly um, adept at providing services. 
and therefore we are providing services on site that would include um, job readiness training, financial literacy, and money management classes. We recently, um, at the beginning of this project, we received funding from the Department of Health to provide substance abuse counseling, mental health services, and benefits assistance. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask our architect to um, talk about the building design. Hello, everyone. My name, can, can you hear me? Sorry, can you get a little closer? Uh, my name is Andrew McIntyre from Robert Stern Architects. Um, I'll first note that Robert Stern Architects very proud to be involved with Breaking Ground and AAPC on this development. and. Um, very excited about the prospect for this project. The uh, building design is, um, uh, you can see here in this image, a uh, view from the corner of Livonia and Howard Avenues. Uh, it's a blend of uh, beige brick and um, uh, metal accents and bay windows. Um, you can see at the corner here the resident entry. Um, all the residents share a, sa a single entry. Uh, separately on Livonia Avenue, you can see the uh, storefront space. Sorry. All right, is it better? Okay. Uh, separately down Livonia Avenue, you can see the um, storefront for the uh, proposed commercial use or retail tenant. Um, as Matthew noted, and you saw in the site photos, this is immediately adjacent to the elevated three train, so this is uh, what you would actually see in that photo. We've removed it here just to show the building. Um, a closer view at the entry, you can see, uh, again, the resident entry here on the corner with a beige uh, brick blend. Uh, there's a custom brick pattern that we've designed for the, the ground floor as well as the uh, facade that faces Livonia. Uh, looking the other way on Livonia Avenue, here you can see the uh, storefronts and the way the uh, retail space would activate the uh, street. Uh, we'd be livening a, a otherwise empty part of Livonia Avenue. The uh, ground floor layout, uh, as Matthew mentioned, is uh, available for community use. There are, there's a multi-purpose room that could be used by uh, various groups within the building and from without. Um, amenities, uh, as again, as Matthew mentioned, a fitness center, laundry, uh, computer space, bike storage, um, as well as the social service office suites, um, and then a uh, commercial space fronting Livonia Avenue. Um, also, as, as Jordan mentioned, uh, this building has many green features that we're very proud of to meet the uh, Enterprise Green Community Standard. Uh, green roof, solar panels that will provide a portion of the building's power, triple glazed windows that will help insulate uh, acoustically as well as um, uh, thermally, and a super insulated building envelope that is part of that system, uh, energy efficient systems throughout, uh, and water conservation features. And I'll hand it back to David or Jordan if there are further questions from the committee, from the council. Yeah, happy to answer any questions. All right, uh, Councilmember Mealy has some questions um, um, regarding the project. When I met with you, um, I asked, uh, "Are you what?" Let me see which one. Breaking Grounds is a homeless shelter program. No, um, no. Breaking Ground is primarily an operator and developer of permanent, affordable, and supportive housing. We do operate. Uh, two safe havens, which are transitional housing programs for street homeless persons, but we do not operate any uh, shelters. Okay, so you would be taking the individuals from those programs into these housing? Yes, our goal is to do in reach in Browns shelters for the homeless units. Do you not know units. Browns will have its fair share of shelters? And I'm not the demographic here. When I asked you, I asked you before, 
Is there any training? You put individuals from a, a shelter straight into public, well, affordable housing, in which now they have to pay rent. They have to pay their light bill. They have to pay if it's gas included or if it's not. They will have to pay these bills. How are you putting people in positions like that with no training, no real support to let them know how to now transition from a shelter into your own apartment? Do you think that's fair to a community? And I asked you, did y'all train people? And you said no. Well, could you put a component in there? The, the on-site services are designed to help homeless people make the transition to uh, permanent housing. Every homeless uh, family or single adult will have a case manager to help make that transition. And in addition to the case management services, there's an array of support services on site that uh, every homeless family or individual will be able to avail themselves of. Security, the front desk. Yes, there'll be a 24 seven attended lobby. Could you see why I'm not supporting this project? You have so many studios, but I have about five different pages that say, one is uh, studios 53, supportive, affordable three, total of 56. One bedroom, three, supportive, affordable, 31. That's people who is in the neighborhood that can now say, all right, I live in uh, Tilden Howard Houses. I could get an apartment now. So affordable, you say 31 of one bedroom apartments. Then you say two bedroom apartments, 15 supportive, 11 affordable. That's 26. Three bedroom apartment, seven supportive, two affordable. I would have loved that to come up. Then I get another one, 53 supportive, three affordable. One bedroom apartment, 15 to 19 affordable apartments, 34. Then I got two bedrooms where it used to be 15, now it's seven and 19 affordable of affordable housing. And then with three bedroom apartments, supportive, you say only three of them, and six now affordable. Then I have another, I could keep going on. I have an issue with this demographic that we're dealing with. We need to make sure that we have people who lived in the neighborhood want to get into affordable housing now, have that opportunity. And by these numbers, you just keep giving me back and forth numbers. I want something concrete. I said I wanted more three-bedroom apartments. We need people who, they have children in Brownsville. And not even thinking about that area, we have a fair share of homeless shelters. We have hotels now that are becoming shelters that the city sometimes have to shut down because it's overran. So with these supportive homeless studios, I'm asking, to bring that down a little and let some people with children living there that it can be a, a real melting pot of Brownsville and affordable housing and supportive housing together. Yeah, again, Councilwoman, this is not a shelter um, or emergency housing. I don't want it to become a shelter right. either. But And it, in response to um, your concerns about the, the numbers and the mix of the affordable units, when we met with you, you expressed concern about that. What is in today's proposal, uh, it's, different. it's different from what we proposed to you because our understanding is that you wanted um, more two bedroom apartments and more three bedroom apartments in the affordable category. And, and that's what we did. We added eight two bedroom apartments in the affordable category and four uh, three bedroom apartments and that was uh, we did that after meeting with you But you still didn't take down none of the studios well, And that's my major issue really I have a question. Let's yes. let's uh, let's get to it. 
Is there a possibility that you can reduce the amount of studio units that you have and increase the amount of three, two, and one bedroom units? No, that's not uh, financially feasible for the project. Um, this was a project with 100 studios. So how could it, it's not a feasible? Let's think about that. So the total number of units was reduced when we responded to that. That so when the concern was raised first by the community about it being 100% studios, the overall unit count was reduced so that we could accommodate more large bedrooms. And a, as I testified, and, and I just want to reiterate the point that many of our proposals that we bring forward to to the council in the supportive housing category are 100% studios or vast majority studios. Th this is absolutely not the case here. The, the majority, 55% of the units, are family-sized units, both in the supportive and in the affordable category. And, and you're right that there are, that the majority of the vast, almost all of the uh, studio units are for supportive, um, but the majority of the project is still uh, not not studio units; they're family-sized units, and that's an that's an aberration from how we normally do these projects. To to respond to that very concern you're raising, we're trying to to respond to that. Not for the studio. All right. Are there? You have any more questions, Council Member? All right. Uh, is there anyone from the public who wishes to testify? Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. So we have Ms. O uh, Olivia Wilkins. Yes. Okay. We have uh, Angela Thomas. Angela? Please come. Come up. We have uh, Donna Bruno. Donna Bruno? Please come up. And we have Reverend Dexter Henderson. So we will, uh, yes, he's testifying. So we will start with Miss uh, Olivia Wilkins. Um, and uh, Sergeant of Arms, if you can just set the timer for two minutes. And uh, if you can just say your name, and you'll have two minutes. Yeah, make sure you press the button. Is it red? No, press it again. My name is Olivia Wilkins. I am here to testify in support of Breaking Grounds proposal to develop Edwin's Place in Brownsville. Anyone who is against Edwin Place has got to have something wrong with them. I currently reside at Redwood Senior Living, located at 890 Skank Avenue in East New York. Redwood was so developed by Breaking Ground and East Brooklyn Congregation on an empty NYCHA parking lot across from Boulevard Housing, where I used to live and raise two kids. When Breaking Ground and East Brooklyn Congregation started construction in Redwood, I was eager to leave my NYCHA building, which had become unsafe and dirty. I didn't want to spend my golden years being scared all the time. Moving into Redwood Senior Living, it was like moving to Paris. The building is so clean you can eat off the floor. Breaking Grounds provides our licensed social, secure, so, sorry, social worker and an active coordinator. We get help with financial resources, social security, food banks, and health care. We go on museum trips, shopping, movies, cooking classes, monthly birthday celebrations, and health care symposiums. We should build 200 more redwoods throughout the city. 
Most importantly, Breaking Ground staff treat us with respect. We feel like family. I understand that the councilwoman, Darlene Mealy, is opposed to letting Breaking Grounds develop Edwin's place, which would be just as nice as where I live. Councilwoman Mealy, you are either with us or against us. You are either with Breaking Grounds, East Brooklyn Congregation, and Edwin Place, or you are against providing quality, affordable housing in our community. Step up, get behind Edwin Place, or step off and get out of the way. Thank you. All right, um, the, we're going to have uh, Miss Angela Thomas. Angela, I'll just uh, turn on the mic, and you'll have two minutes. And I'm just going to ask the speakers to please be respectful. Yes, um, my name is Ms. Thomas. Um, I'm a resident at UF, and um, I just recently came from the shelter, about five years. About five years there in the shelter. And um, I can only say that uh, being there with, e with SUS have given me my life back. I now I'm going back to school and doing the things that I couldn't have done when I was in a shelter, and especially becoming a vegetarian. I can now prepare my own meals because I was practically dying over there because I lost a lot of weight because I couldn't eat that food. Now I can prepare my own meals. I'm back in school. I feel like I'm back personally. I feel like I got my life back, my mental state back, and it's a very beautiful apartment. I'm good with security being there. I, I, I'm feel, I feel safe there, and it's beautiful. We have a washing machine there. I do my homework on the computer downstairs. So everything's there, including my case manager. I suffer with depression, so, you know, I just wish everybody can come out of those shelters and be where I'm at because they do give you your life back. All right, thank you. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Donna Bruno. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Donna Bruno, and I come from Concern for Independent Living, East New York, Crown Heights. Um, I've been living there five and a half years. I am also on the advisory committee board for five and a half years as well. Uh, I live in a studio apartment, and um, our building interacts with uh, supportive housing and non-supporting houses, families, children people with physical disabilities, mental disorders, homelessness, people from shelters. And it seems that we all get together very well. When you live with people for a long time and you get to know people, it works. When you get to walk around your community and you interact with the people in your community, the community interacts with you. And the only way a community interacts if we have the support and the backing from council people um, and supportive housing and people who can actually do something for us. We shouldn't have, just because sometimes the numbers don't add up right, and sometimes the buildings don't add up right, but why should people be subjected to being in a shelter or homeless or because they have a mental disability being in, in a psychiatric ward or in a transitional living? Because why? Because there's not too many studios and not enough one-bedroom apartments. That's petty. The most important thing is the people, it's the communities. And yes, you are right. There are a lot of shelters and there are a lot of hotels. You can just wrap up. Okay, you, you are right about one thing, but the bottom line is, is that with more supportive housing, you will have less of that problem. All Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up we have Mr. Reverend uh, Dexter Henderson. You ladies can stay there because I'm just going to, uh, after the Reverend finishes, I'm going to allow the council member to ask questions. Good afternoon. My name is Reverend Dexter Henderson, and I'm here on behalf of my pastor, 
Reverend David K. Brawley from the St. Paul Community Baptist Church. I'm also here representing all the churches, schools, and leaders of East Brooklyn congregations. Edwin's Place and our partners Breaking Ground have EBCs in St. Paul's full support to develop 125 urgently needed units of affordable housing in Brownsville. Breaking Ground is the city's best supportive housing developer in the city, and we've worked with them on Redwood, the Hegeman, and Irving Dominique buildings in Ocean Hill and Brownsville. Two weeks ago, I joined more than 6,000 fellow New Yorkers and leaders from East Brooklyn congregations and Metro IAF downstairs to push Mayor de Blasio to develop more senior housing, fix NYCHA from the top to bottom, and build more developments just like Edwin's Place. We rallied in the pouring rain and humidity because we were so angry that lifelong black and Latino New Yorkers are being thrown out of their homes like trash so that their rents can be raised. Mm -hmm. Then we come to find out that Councilwoman Darlene Mealy, not the mayor, is trying to stop breaking ground and East Brooklyn congregations from developing Edwin's Place and two other smaller sites in Brownsville and Ocean Hill. Here, the mayor and the city are doing their job. They provided the land, the subsidies, and the support. We are on the same side on this issue. So leaders of the Brooklyn, East Brooklyn congregations have been trying to get a meeting with Councilwoman Mealy for two months, and we have been ignored. EBC does not tolerate that type of disrespect. So I'm here to send a message to you, Councilwoman Mealy, your colleagues, and the mayor. To you, Councilwoman Mealy, you're going to get behind Edwin's place and our plans also to develop two smaller sites nearby. My pastor and I will be bringing 50 leaders to your Brooklyn office this Thursday at 10.30 a.m. You're going to meet with us and get behind Edwin's place, and if you don't believe me, all you have to do is ask around. To the other council members, Sir, we I'm need gonna your ask, support. I'm going to ask you to please wrap up. Sometime very soon, and you're going to have to vote on this. Please do not make the same mistake of voting no, because we'll be at your offices as well. And to the mayor, finally, we're in this fight to save our city all the way. You're going to see that we are very capable if you decide to partner with EBC and build more places like Redwood Senior Living and Edwin's Place. If you continue to provide the land and subsidies Sir, that we've done here, up, we will help you take care of the Darlene Mealies and anyone else who chooses to stand in the way of real affordable housing in this city. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Mealy, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Um, just for our young lady, um, you said that she was in NYCHA, you was in NYCHA housing, and then you went to Red Development, senior housing. That's a totally different thing from this development. So I, I'm glad that you went into senior housing. If we had more senior housing like that, I'll be jumping up and down. But for this right now, Browns will have its fair share of homeless and studios. If you could give me more, because we have people who have been in Brownsville, want to get out of public housing into affordable two and three and one bedroom apartments also. So pastor or uh, Reverend, yes. I'm looking forward because I know I've been doing right by this district. We have more than enough affordable housing in the 40, 41st Council Magic District. I fight more than enough. So therefore, if you feel you want to come visit me, please, I'm looking forward to you. Thank but you. right now, I, I disapprove this project. I need more affordable three bedrooms, two bedrooms, and less studios. If you want, I sent you my um, letter that I, I'm not in support of this, and I hope you put it in the record. Thank you. I got that. All right, thank you very much, Council Member. Are there any more members of the public who wish to testify? All right, seeing none, I will now close the public hearings on LU 792 through 795. Mm. LU 792 through 795, Edwin's Place, uh, seven, LU 797, Archer, uh, Green, LU-746, Elton and NCP Park have been laid over. I would like to thank the council and land use staff for, for preparing today's hearing and members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>